to Ethiopia, where Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed has announced a, quote, final military operation against the defiant Tigray province in coming days. Ethiopia's Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed insists his country will not descend into chaos. Now, uh, the UN's Rights Commission has called for a full inquiry into possible war crimes in Ethiopia after reports emerged of a massacre of civilians in the Tigray region. Fighting in northern Ethiopia threatens to tip that country into civil war. Last year, Ethiopia's prime minister won the Nobel Peace Prize. Now, he's waging war in the country's north. What happened to democracy and who's to blame? November 4th, 2020. All right, welcome back. This is CNN's special live coverage. I was deep in following the U.S. presidential election. And this was a special year, so we didn't get the results the night of the election. I was switching from channel to channel, going on different sites to get results. My obsession with American politics had hit a peak. But if you ask me since that week what's been going on in American politics, I would have nothing to tell you. And that's for the first time in 20 years that I've been living here. Unless, of course, it has something to do with Tigray. I will never forget where I was when I learned that the war on Tigray had started. I was sitting at home, it was election night, and I did a lot of work campaigning and canvassing, and we were watching the results roll in, and a friend of mine came over, and she was in tears. And I was like, you know, joking with her. I'm like, why are you crying? You know, Trump's losing, it's all good. <laughs> and she said, no, they're bombing Tigray. And I was like, what do you mean they're bombing Tigray? And it was, it was a really devastating moment because for us, we were, we thought we were gonna celebrate a change of government here in the United States. It was, you know, we'd worked so hard for that success and we didn't even get one night's rest when we learned that our families were being, you know, were under siege, were being bombed by their own government. I found out about the war when I was in my establishment uh, and my father called me and broke me the news. I never thought my own country would, at, would attack my family members. I can't remember exactly where I was, probably at work when I found out, but it was very, very shocking, especially given the fact that my family lives there currently. My dad is there. Um, I remember us trying to rush to the phone to try to reach them and call them and warn them, and, and we couldn't do that. I was born and raised in San Francisco, California. My parents immigrated from Tigray in the 80s, and I decided to move to Tigray in 2019. Before the war, I had an agricultural business, a commercial farm in the southern part of Tigray. I spent most of my time working on that. November 3rd, I spent the day in Raya on my farm. I spent the whole day uh, planting my first plants for our first harvest. And I returned back to the capital city, which is about three hours away. And I was just exhausted from my day on the farm. So I went to sleep. And a short while after, I was awakened by the sound of gunfire. Not normal gunfire, but warfare, like battle got my phone and called a friend of mine. We were trying to figure it out, but while I was speaking with her, the power cut out and the phones cut off. So when I woke up the next day, I went to the nearest hotel. The hotels usually have generators in Tigray. And I found out there on the national media that Ethiopia had invaded Tigray and we were at war. Would Niagara has boy, Zare, Kahadi Ethiopian, Ethiopian Waktawata. Ethiopia, Yagorra Sejwa, Yatabba Totwa, Tanakswa. La Lafut Hayamatat, Bekabarum Shikus Bamon, Hagare, Wagane, Hezbeblo, Babazu Shoch Maswat and Netkaflo, Koslo, Demto, Dekmo. Hagarun and Nahasbun, yet at Dago Yagar Makalaka Saravit, Zare Mishit, Kamakale Jamro, Beverkat Tasafrauch, Bakahari Hailoch, and Navadrajut Hail, Takat, Tafasamo Bata. I was actually talking to my dad, which uh, currently he was in Makala, so he was living in Addis, but two months prior to the war, he went to Tigray uh, to work. So I was talking to him the day before, and then the next day, 
I couldn't call him anymore, basically. I was in Denver. Um, my dad was sick at the time, so we were taking care of him. Um, and I was with some of my cousins, um, well, cousins, you know, that you create when you come to this country and you're like, okay, we're gonna create community. Um, and so upon just being in, in, in their house and, and talking to them, um, that's how I found out. Um, and immediately started looking up the, like, the hashtags and trying to find every bit of information that was flowing in from different, different states and different countries. I was actually at my mom's house. We normally uh, get together at my mom's house to drink coffee. So we were at home with my mom. We got a phone call uh, from my family uh, back in Quija. Now, Quija is uh, the North Wing military station. That, like, that's one of the biggest military camp in Ethiopia. When the war uh, broke out, of course, uh, that's where it started. There were allegations that the Tigray government had uh, information that the North Wing was getting ready to attack. I guess uh, the attack happened and my family, they are very close to uh, where the military camp is and they, they heard the gunshots and they, they called us scared saying, you know, the fighting has started. And not too long after that, maybe, I don't know, five minutes into the phone call, the phone call just cut off. Yeah, my dad was in Tigray, my mom was in Tigray, my two sisters was in Tigray, my sister's husband and their one-year-old. So I didn't know what was going on basically for the first two months or two and a half months because all phone uh, lines were not working all over Tigray. About a year before the war broke out, I was in Addis Ababa, the capital city of Ethiopia. That's where I was born and raised. I had been away for 18 years and I was overjoyed to be back home. I knew there were some tensions brewing between Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, who came into power in 2018, and the TPLF, the political party leading the Tigray region. But I never thought a war was on the horizon. I was dumbfounded when the war broke out. I had to go back and do so much research to understand what led to this conflict. But in order to give you a full context of not just the war, but the relationship of Tigray and Ethiopia as a state, I have to take you back not a few years before the war, but back to the founding of Ethiopia as a state. Let's go back to the mid-1800s. The region that's considered northern Ethiopia and Eritrea today has been ruled by various kingdoms. The first one is the Damat Kingdom. It was followed by the very powerful Aksum Empire, the Zagwe Dynasty, and the Solomonic Dynasty. The Aksum Kingdom, rising from modern-day Tigray, is a especially significant part of Ethiopian history. It's under that kingdom that the Ge'ez writing, commonly known as the Ethiopian alphabet, was developed. Both Christianity and Islam were accepted in the region under the Aksum Empire. It's for that reason that many historians say Tigray is the founding state of what later on became the Ethiopian state. By the mid-1700s, centralized power declined and the era of princes was born. The area was divided within itself into several regions and each had its own practically independent leadership. Then in 1855 came the power of Tedros, which gave birth to modern day Ethiopia. Rising up from Gondar in modern day Amhara state, Tedros unified the divided regions into one cohesive Ethiopian state. He became king of kings, ruling over the lords of the other provinces in the area, including the Tigray and Shoa provinces. So he is the one now who is going to begin to fight all the princes, all the lords, and begin to unite Ethiopia. So under Tedros, the northern half of the Ethiopian plateau was united, it became one. After Tedros's death came King Johannes of the Tigray province, who then ruled over the Ethiopian state as king. After Johannes, the kingship went to Minilik of Shoa, perhaps the most consequential leader in modern Ethiopian history. The moment that Johannes died at Matama, Tigray was exhausted after 17 years of war. Huh? against the uh, uh, Mahdists, uh, against the Italians, against the Egyptians. At the end of this, Tigray was totally exhausted. About the same time as the scramble for Africa was taking place, King Minilik was expanding the boundaries of Ethiopia. 
Menelik now already have the northern half united by Tedros and Johannes. He has to conquer the southern half. So the way we see now Ethiopia actually was established more under Menelik. The state of Ethiopia comprises over 80 ethnic groups, with the biggest ones being the Oromos, Amharas, Somali, and Tigrayans. There was uh, this uh, Italian by the name Antonelli, who befriended uh, Menelik. So uh, in May 1889, Antonelli and Menelik signed the Treaty of Uchale. It's in that treaty that he said it, part of Tigray to the Italians, which is present day Eritrea, by the way. They were contending Tigrayan uh, uh, races, we call them races now, the rank under, under king. Ras Mangesha, for instance, who claims he's the son of Emperor Johannes, who wanted to become king of Ethiopia. Nilik was threatened by Mangesha, actually. So in order to weaken those contending forces, he has to uh, 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 cede part of their territory to Italy, to weaken them. When he agreed with uh, the Italians uh, where the borders will be, you know, at, uh, around Merab, uh, and he divided the Tigrinya people into two. One was that, of course, it weakens the uh, Tigrinya Empire, or what, whatever you call it, Tigrinya, the Tigrinya-speaking people, that, uh, that area, it was divided in between two. Tigray had no more access to the sea. So these were mainly the two things that weakened uh, Tigray. By 1890, the Italians proclaimed their new colony. They are new and first colony in Africa, Eritrea. So they expanded further to the western part, up to Sudan border. They've taken so, so much land, actually. Then Menelik himself was infuriated. And then he actually denounced the Treaty of Uchale uh, in 1894. So then after that, of course, it would take only two years to the Battle of Adwa. and the Italians were defeated at the Battle of Adwa. Now, some historians say that at that point in time, when the Italians were devastatingly defeated, Menelik could have driven the Italians away from Eritrea. But he refrained from doing that in fear of the resurgence of the Tigrinya people. After that, up to now, we see the consequences of that division. Once the Tigrinya speaking were divided into Eritrea and Tigray, up to now, that division holds, holds for various reasons. And we have seen the consequences lately uh, in the Tigray War. The monarchy system continued in Ethiopia after King Menelik's death. In 1930, perhaps the most recognizable Ethiopian leader came to power, King Haile Selassie. He was the longest reigning monarch in modern Ethiopian history, 1930 to 1974. Between this period, of course, the dominant group was the Amharas. Their language was dominant. Everything was dominating, actually. Amharic became actually not only the official, but the dominant language. King Haile Selassie's rule was a furtherment of this feudalist system that had been ruling Ethiopia for decades. But the world was going through some dramatic changes. Over in Italy, Benito Mussolini was hatching a plan to invade Ethiopia and avenge the defeat Italy faced during the Battle of Adwa. In 1934, Italy invaded Ethiopia. In 1936, Emperor Haile Selassie went to exile in England, where he stayed until 1941. Ethiopian troops, backed by British forces, liberated Ethiopia from Italy, and Emperor Haile Selassie came back to Ethiopia in 1941. When Haile Selassie came back from exile after the Second World War, I suspect that was where his, the idea of centralization came to him. So what he tried to do then was, he tried to undermine the nobility, uh, the, the jazmats, uh, the rasas, you know, the, 
uh, and all the other nobility by imposing centralization. Uh, for the first time, Ethiopia was divided into 13 provinces. The administrators for the Waradas, Aurajas, and things like that, and pro which means the provinces, hmm, all came from Addis Ababa. So you see, so there is some kind of uniformity where it's being centralized in Addis Ababa. So at that point in time, that was when Kadamai Weyani, uh, the first Weyani rebellion came to be. Because all, many of them also rebelled the other parts of Ethiopia, but as usual, it was the Tigray rebellion that stood out at that time. In 1943, a crucial event takes place in our story. The very first Wayani resistance was born in the province of Tigray. They had an agenda. Uh, number one was autonomous self-determination. And this was not good for Haider Selassie because Haider Selassie, like Menelik, centralized Ethiopia. He wants to govern the whole of Ethiopia from Addis Ababa. He's not going to really uh, uh, yield to the idea of self-determination or autonomous uh, governance. And they, wa they want someone, a leader, to be appointed from Tigray, not from Shoah or from Addis. They were uh, rebelling against also heavy taxation at that, at that, at that point in time. And it was a big movement, by the way. They had about 20,000 followers. 20,000 people have had arms. Uh, it was a big uprising. And they defeated uh, the Ethiopian army almost in every battle. Haile Selassie could not crush the rebellion by himself. So he sought assistance uh, from the British. The British were the ones who helped him to come back from exile anyway. The British were allies of Emperor Haile Selassie. So the Royal Air Force of the British coming from Yemen bombarded Maqala, the capital city. It's believed that they conducted 80 sorties. 80 times they, they flew to hit many places uh, in, in Tigray. After that, it was brutally crashed, of course. Huh? Many of them were taken prisoners. Tigray was made uh, to, to pay heavily for the loss of whatever loss the government has had after, after that time. But more importantly, two places, the, the, the contested areas now. The area of Tigray used to reach until Eliwaha, until Kobo, which is Kobo right now, Eliwaha at that time, and on the other place until Humara. Both of them were taken away from Tigray after that time. Another historical event that takes place under King Haile Selassie is the integration of Eritrea back into the Ethiopian state after Italy was defeated during World War II. After staying under British rule for a short while, it was decided that Eritrea would be joined back with Ethiopia as a federation. But there were challenges to this decision later on giving birth to a resistance that would call for the independence of Eritrea. And by 1971, another organization, the Eritrean People's Liberation Front, EPLF, which is the current, the current uh, governing party in, in Asmara, they began in 1971-72 After four decades of power, King Haile Selassie was ousted through a military coup. The Derg ended hundreds of years of monarchy rule in Ethiopia. The new military leadership brought progress on one hand and unbelievable brutality on the other. Uh, Haile Selassie, you know, uh, by the early 1970s, he always, almost came to a dead end, you know. One thing that uh, uh, led to his fall, uh, an additional thing, was the, uh, the mass starvation that happened, the famine that happened then, which killed hundreds of thousands of people. And uh, instead of reacting to it uh, properly uh, and at, at, at timely, on timely basis, uh, he tried to, uh, hide, uh, to hide it from the world. In 1960s, when the student movements, the uh, farmers uprising started in Ethiopia, the question of nations, nationalities and peoples especially the question of self-rule self or self-administration 
come into being or uh, come uh, to the political atmosphere of the country. He first achieved notoriety in 1974 when, as a major in the army, he played a leading role in the coup that overthrew the 800-year-old dynasty of Emperor Haile Selassie. Three years later, Mengistu took control of the army and the instruments of government. Observers say many of his political opponents were jailed or murdered as he embraced a form of Marxism that made him friends and brought him much-needed foreign aid, principally from the Soviet Union. The Derg is also known for red terror. Uh, red terror, it's known as red terror because uh, it was done under the name of uh, communism. Huh? Uh, but uh, ironically, uh, it was killing uh, the very people that consider themselves leftists, basically the students. Uh, the massacre it was in tens of thousands. In every city, you see uh, students killed and uh, uh, they were shown off uh, uh, because they have to be, uh, they want to make a lesson out of them. Of course, this is absurd. I mean, in the first place, it is not in my nature to kill even an insect or a small living thing, let alone human beings. If anyone perished during the planting of the revolution, it was certainly not on my orders. I did not single out any individual to be killed. This outrages my sense of humanity. The year 1975 is another crucial year in our storyline. It's the year that TPLF was born. TPLF stands for Tigray People Liberation Front. The TPLF was not the only group that rose up and posed a threat to the Derg rule. Ethnic-based groups popped up in various parts of Ethiopia, notably the Eritrean People's Liberation Front in Eritrea, Oromo Liberation Front in the Oromia region, and the Ogaden National Liberation Front in Somalia. The most powerful groups fighting the Derg were the TPLF and EPLF. This leftist group grew out of Addis Ababa students who left their studies to take up arms against what they believed would be the ultimate socialist revolution to oust the existing inequalities among ethnic groups and classes in Ethiopia. There were a band of, of a group of guerrilla warfare, like 20 of them. But, but, but uh, increasingly, they. Uh, they enjoyed the support of the people. They became thousands. <laughs> and by guerrilla warfare, of course, they grew into enormous, enormous uh, liberation front. So what they saw was a division between ethnic groups. For example, one ethnic group, the Amhara, huh, uh, was uh, the ruling ethnic group in Ethiopia. Huh? Uh, its, its language is being used as, uh, you know, uh, as the only language uh, of education and administration in, entirely in Ethiopia. So they say that in order to bridge the differences in between uh, ethnic groups, we need this revolution. But I believe they had a problem, you know, maturing in the bigger organization until uh, about around 18, uh, the early 80s, when, the, when mass starvation hit Tigray. And they were the ones who helped the, the, the peasant to reach Sudan because they couldn't get any help, you know. Even at that time, you know, the, similar to what is happening today, Derg used uh, hunger as a weapon uh, at that time. The only difference was, at that time, the hunger was brought naturally, you know, it became, it's not artificially made as, as, in, uh, as in this case, as in this recent phenomena. But, but still, he tried to use uh, hunger uh, as a weapon. The most awful story this day, this week, this time, continues to be the famine in Africa. The tragedy of men, women, and little children by the thousands dying of thirst, starvation, and disease. Clearly the most disgusting sidebar story to this main event is the one of political murder, the continuing charge that with the silent acquiescence of the United Nations and others, the Ethiopian government is intentionally preventing food and other aid from reaching some of its people. They are the residents of the provinces of Eritrea and Tigray in, the nor in northern Ethiopia near the Sudan. And uh, the Tigrayan, uh, the TPLF, 
uh, did uh, uh, almost a miracle at that time. Hundreds of it transported hundreds of thousands of Tigrayan peasants to Sudan in order to get aid. That era gave a boost to uh, Tigray in terms of recreation. It got uh, thousands of uh, Tigrayan peasants began to join it. There is no point in fighting if the people are finished. This is the saddest time in my life. I have seen many desperate times, but none of them is as desperate as this one. Because the people that I am fighting for are dying because of lack of food. They are hardworking, but because of lack of support, because of lack of scientific agricultural practice, these people are dying because of no fault of themselves. That's the toughest thing for a fighter to face. After 17 years of fighting, the rebels ousted the Derg in 1991. The years following 1991 brought huge changes to the way the Ethiopian government is structured. Eritrea held a referendum and declared independence from Ethiopia. The TPLF joined hands with three other groups to form the Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Democratic Front, a political party which went on to rule for 27 years. Nine new states were formed in Ethiopia along major ethnic lines and languages. Each state was given the right to use their native language for schools and government functions, while Amharic remained the working language of the Ethiopian federal government. The EPRDF was formed from political groups representing the regions of Tigray, Amhara, Oromo, and the southern nation's nationalities and peoples. The EPRDF had its challenges since inception. It's after 1995 that the constitution, the new constitution of Ethiopia was drafted. In the constitution, it says from now on, Ethiopia is going to be a federal government with autonomous regions. Those autonomous regions that we call today Kullal, there were nine of them. And I personally supported it. There were some people who said this is going to have a negative impact on the unity of Ethiopia. Uh, they supported a more unified, centralized government. But I say the more centralized government was not a just government. Personally, I believe that they were on the right track when they tried to make, uh, create kilos of provinces along the uh, ethno-linguistic lines. Which means uh, language is what will determine uh, the borders of the uh, of the provinces from now on. That has been done in many other areas of the world. The other part of the problem with the EPRDF is that it was not exactly, you know, uh, federalism per se that they have created because uh, you cannot have federalism without democracy. It's impossible. There is no nation in the world that has federalism without democracy. EPRDF still controlled uh, the, the federal states. It was a, um, a form of government which was autocratic, but it uh, maintained stability over the country. Uh, it also had, I think, fairly significant economic progress. The elections were far from uh, satisfactory that occurred during the time of the EPRDF. On the other hand, there were elections which you didn't have prior to the EPRDF government. After protests over Ethiopia's elections, more than 30 leading opposition members are sentenced to life. Law and order at work or a bit by the country's premier to silence his critics. With respect to the development of state, bringing development to Ethiopia, creating major projects, economic projects, uh, infrastructures, they built so many things. However, I criticized them 
And this book, with respect to democracy, my proposal was that they were going to establish some democratic institutions. They did not do it. And they were not tolerant to people who came up with different ideas. When it comes to TPLF's role in EPRDF, uh, it had uh, uh, the land share. Uh, I believe it had the land share, huh? and it was not hidden from everybody. Uh, Melles was the one who was uh, at the top at the, at the beginning. Uh, even when uh, later, when uh, Ayla Mariam de Salin became prime, uh, prime minister, even then I believe the, uh, the TPLF was the dominant. EPRDF, you see, I see it dual-faced, uh, uh, dual-faced world. EPRDF was good, excellent at uh, developing the nation. For example, uh, in 1990, just before uh, EPRDF came to power, the life expectancy of Ethiopians was 47 years, 47 years, imagine that. By the time EPRDF ended its power in 2018, it was 66 years. Almost 20 years, they have added almost 20 years. That by itself is a huge accomplishment. In general, the GDP was uh, among the fastest uh, uh, growth in the world. So they did all of this, but to your question, when you come to the, uh, the deficiency, the democratic deficiency. The democratic deficiency was big. Battles on the front line in the Horn of Africa. It's estimated that half a million troops are still deployed on both sides of the disputed border between Ethiopia and Eritrea. In 1998, not even a decade into Eritrea's independence, a war broke out between Eritrea and Ethiopia. When we were friends, I was not of the opinion that he was capable of invading us. I was not of the opinion that he was capable of stabbing us in the back. I mean, fundamentally, um, the way relations had broken down between Ethiopia and Eritrea um, that led to the war, to post-secession, I mean, that was really a breakdown in relations between the between the, to the TPLF leaders and, and Isaias. And so, you know, of course, there's many different ways of, of breaking down the, the history there. And um, of course, it was not just the TPLF that, that prosecuted that war and, and all the rest of it. But I mean, fundamentally, you know, that was a dispute between, and that was, a, that was, a, it, was the, it was the result of the complete breakdown in the relationship between, you know, Meles and Isaias and, and others. Eritrea declared independence from Ethiopia in 1991, a move that was formally ratified in a referendum two years later. A subsequent border war with Ethiopia claimed more than 150,000 lives between 1998 and 2000. Although an agreement was signed, the issue continues to be a source of tension between the two countries and the long-running border dispute remains unresolved. Well, uh, the war, of course, went badly for Eritrea. Hmm? Uh, at the beginning, it was uh, it was it had some uh, kind of victory, yeah? uh, but uh, it was uh, devastating for Eritrea. The Ethiopia-Eritrea war came to an end in 2000, but the damage between these two countries lasted way beyond the two years of active war. In fact, the two countries remained in a state of no peace, no war for almost 20 years, until the arrival of Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed. Ethiopia's Oromia region on edge as fierce anti-government protests continue. The UN human rights body repeating its calls to send in independent observers. After leading the country for over two decades, the protests against the EPRDF only got louder and bolder. The protests against the TPLF, part of the EPRDF coalition that had the lion's share of power, was especially fierce. There was opposition from the Oromo and the Amhara mainly. There was a you know, clear sense that because the sort of shutout of the opposition had been confirmed, you know, from 2010 to 2015, um, that there was a lot of pressure building. After years of violently suppressing protests, the EPRDF announced that they were ready for major reforms. Ethiopia's Prime Minister says he has submitted his resignation as both Prime Minister and the Chairman of the ruling coalition to allow for reforms in the country. Ethiopia has been rocked by mass protests and a political crisis that has led to the loss of thousands of lives. Now in a closed session, 
the APRDF was actually preparing to select the chair of the APRDF who would ultimately become the prime minister. That's how it works in parliamentary democracy. So ultimately, Abiy Ahmed was selected. Well, after a month of uncertainty, Abiy Ahmed is now set to become the new prime minister of Ethiopia. Abiy Ahmed is the first Oromo prime minister in 27 years. He now acts as the chairman of the EPRDF, the Ethiopian ruling party. Abiy Mania took over Ethiopia instantly. His promise of wide-ranging reforms while embracing forgiveness, peace and unity resonated with a population looking for a fresh beginning. He freed political prisoners, welcomed back opposition parties that were in exile, and even made peace with the leader of Eritrea. That peace deal with Eritrea earned him the Nobel Peace Prize in 2019. My reaction was pretty much the reaction of most people who were following Ethiopian affairs, one of great optimism, one that uh, a new wind was blowing and in Addis Ababa, one that was going to be more democratic along sort of Western democratic lines. The West were behind him. Uh, they even uh, gave him the Nobel Prize. Uh, which was a perfect camouflage, you know, a perfect uh, uh, cover for him uh, to undertake his preparations for war. Uh, domestically also, he was received uh, uh, enthusiastically at the beginning. Even the Tigrayans, you know, even the Tigrayans were fed up uh, by the TPLF interference in Tigray, you know. Even in Tigray, you know, there was, uh, it's hard to say that there was democracy in Tigray. Uh, when Abi came, they were really uh, receptive, you know, uh, and they said, uh, Fine. As so far as it could bring a difference in Tigray, we are for it. Tigray, have kermi mot ata uvilom. Menta fetehen maarnetin kavir maswatinet zakhafalun nehensat Ethiopia beza zakhonun jaganu kamin nesohol Muse Walta Haftom Alabet Hayelom Brahan Maskel Ashikabru Ashikabru Amora Talaun Gazau Bifillai. When when he went to Mahala and made that famous uh, speech where he recognized the role of Tigray, where he recognized the, the 17 years struggle of, of Tigray and where, where essentially he put Tigrayans at the center of, of Ethiopia. And I think that made almost everybody kind of happy and, and content with, with him. But that didn't last long. He, he started um, blaming literally everything, everything that had gone wrong for the last for the previous um, 27 years uh, on to grants and I think that um, that sounded the, the alarm bells in, in, in Tigray. So when did it appear like Abi was not maybe the reforms that everybody was hoping? Oh, <laughs> it depends on whom you ask, you know. For many people, for some people, you know, uh, they knew exactly when they saw him, you know, they doubted him. They doubted him. Might have taken a few in a few months to, uh, to say, okay, this guy is not going to do it, you know. But uh, for me, for example, it took a few months uh, to understand what kind of a person he is because there were signals, you know. For example, uh, he was a delusional leader, you know. You could, you could see, for example, when he said that his mother prophesied that he was going to be a seventh king, you know. Huh? He said that <laughs> right after uh, he became prime minister, you know. Huh?
that by itself was enough for people to say, well, is this guy right or not, you know? But not only delusional, but another part of him was he was a charlatan, you know? Charlatanism is uh, the, main character, the main characteristics of charlatanism is there is no content in what you say. There is no content or meaning uh, per se you know, that you can pin down, you know? He used assassinations, you know, for his political means. For example, when Haj uh, Alu Hendesa, you know, that famous uh, uh, Oromo singer and also activist died, was assassinated. He used that opportunity uh, to imprison tens of thousands of people. It appeared that he was taking on some of the same autocratic tendencies that so many Ethiopian leaders have had over the millennia. Tensions between Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed and the TPLF, who were once in the same political coalition, started showing up almost immediately. Maybe the first real warning sign that I recall was the reaction to the grenade attack in Mescal Square. This was the moment the grenade exploded close to where Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed was sitting. After the attack, Abiy said that those trying to divide Ethiopia would not succeed. Certain groups planned and coordinated to destroy this large gathering, to kill innocent people and to spill blood on our streets. But I think the very quick framing of so sort of, Abby's sort of nascent sort of political opponent um, in, in the form of the, you know, the Oromo Liberation Front and the, and the, the TPLF, sort of shadowy TPLF security operative. Some, something didn't feel right to me about that. Because it, it's you know, one of those things when um, there's people are framed too quickly. The responses are too quickly, too quick from the government, which gives the impression that whatever happened, you know, you feel like there's an element of opportunism at the very least. He began to come up with this uh, vocabulary of hate uh, directed at TPLF and at the Tigrayan people. Another thing that he did was for the people to, to take it that almost every problem in Ethiopia had to do with TPLF and Tigray itself. That was also another achievement of his hate speech. Another one, another one of that he used to do at that time was uh, erase the legacy of uh, TPLF eh, in the 27 years past. He called, it, he called it 27 years of darkness. It was for a reason. He was saying that anything good that happens at that time has nothing to do with TPLF. And anything bad that happened at that time has to do with uh, TPLF. When he went to Tigray, he said the Tigrayan people are golden people, beautiful people, and all those positive things he was talking about. Okay? <laughs> now he's, he's a completely different person because, because the only challenge that comes to his power was the TPLF. More positive note, Ethiopia and Eritrea have signed an agreement to bolster relations between the two countries which had been at war for 20 years. The deal was signed on Sunday at a summit in, a, in Saudi Arabia. The details of the agreement signed in the presence of Saudi's, uh, Saudi Arabia's King Salman and UN Secretary General uh, Antonio Guterres were not immediately made clear. I can for sure say uh, that the moment he made a pact with his ass, uh, the moment that they made that Jeddah uh, peace agreement with the Sahas, eh, I believe that was the beginning of the war. Uh, because Isaias, you know, uh, never makes mistakes in these this kinds of things. As soon as he saw Abi, uh, he never made a mistake. The West, for example, made. The, the West took him for reformer and stuff like that. For Isaias, it was clear that it was the mirror image of himself that he was looking at. There is a guy who wants to rule Ethiopia by hook or by crook for many years to come. That he understood immediately. And he wants help in that. He wants help in that. And for Abi, uh, 
uh, the help starts from, you know, how do I consolidate my power in Ethiopia? For Isaias, Tigray. For Isaias, it's clear it's Tigray. For uh, uh, 20 years, he has been waiting for his time to avenge himself or whatever it is, you know. The encirclement of Tigray hmm, uh, became possible uh, with the coming of Abi. Prior to that, Eritrea had done its, its part. It had encircled it, half of that. In those three years in between, if you see in the three years uh, since Abi came hmm, uh, until the war, uh, the encirclement of Tigray was already in the making. Remember the Amhara? They have blocked their roads that lead to Tigray eh? almost for three years. They didn't allow anything to pass through the Amhara land. All the things that came to Tigray was through Afar. So they had already done, you know, the blueprints of what was about to come was already there. So uh, the next thing that they did to, to make a preparation of, for war was, uh, how does Eritrea lift the sanctions that was imposed on it by the United Nations, mainly the arms embargo. That they worked very hard soon after Abi came to power. The first thing that he did was, how do I rehabilitate Isaiah? How did I rehabilitate Shabia or Eritrea huh? into the world? Because it's a pariah nation. Until that, it was a pariah nation. After, after winning, especially after winning the Nobel Prize, you know, uh, it was easier for him to uh, to do all these kinds of things. Mangist Eritrea, nay salam haile mukhanu. Ethiopia atrah zaykunat alam faliti yuzalbo. Abzukon alam tahirka. Mangist Eritrea nay salam yuzalrah. Nilamati yuzalrah. Zubel amnati yuzalbo. He was able to convince the West and thereby also the UN in order to lift the sanctions of. Or on Eritrea. By doing that, they were doing, he was trying to rearm Eritrea for the war. It was the first step in their preparations for war against, uh, against Tigray. So to me, they were just looking for a pretext. After that, they were looking for a pretext uh, to conduct war. In the middle of this tension, a global pandemic broke out. The Ethiopian federal government passed a decision to postpone the national 2020 elections, but not everybody agreed with that decision. The TPLF, up in the Tigray region, decided it would be unconstitutional to postpone the elections. They passed their own decisions, which was to hold regional elections in Tigray. I'm here to vote so that the party or government that rules is legitimate. This election has a big value for me as well as for the Tigrayan people. As a whole, we struggled for elections to be held every five years. ናይ <laughs> ወጣቶች ማለክ እናቶች ማልቀስ ቤቶች መፍረስ ህዝቦች መፈናቀል የለባቸው My name is Duke Burbridge. I have been a researcher for the past 15 years uh, primarily with non-profit organizations in the field of peace building or conflict resolution countering violent extremism. It was sort of a quirk of fate. Uh, my last assignment, my very last assignment was to do research in Ethiopia. And it was sort of a dream project for me because I had been studying violent extremism for 15 years. And this was the first time I got to study religious tolerance. 
which was very new to me. And I was in Addis Ababa for uh, once in November 2019, and then again in 2020, early 2020, when COVID broke out. And so I had to stop my, my work while I was there. As I was, you know, as I was following the news and waiting for this project to restart, which never did, it was immediately apparent that the narrative that was being promoted was inconsistent. There were contradictions with what was being said before. When I was in Addis, the uh, Prime Minister was, was talking about the TPLF as a good thing. He was trying to court them into the, the Prosperity Party at the time. And then after I left and the COVID lockdown happened, then uh, they, they said that uh, Jawar uh, Mohammed was a terrorist. They said that the uh, TPLF were terrorists. Everything, everybody that seemed to stand against the ruling party became a terrorist. And as a sort of a terrorist expert, it, it raised red flags with me. You know, I was up in Tigray just before the war. Um, they were expecting war. Um, I spoke to people in Addis after that. They were welcoming war, um, expecting war. I was told that Uriah and Walkait would be liberated soon. Um, I was told that 10 days before the war. There's no doubt in my mind that a federal intervention was being prepared. So the, the war was coming. Um, and my understanding of events on the 3rd of November is that around 10 p.m. in the evening, I think, um, some Tigrayan officers in the Northern Command in conjunction with the regional government um, took as much of the Northern Command over as possible or at least neutralized it so it couldn't participate in a federal intervention. Um, but that was because they believed that federal intervention was imminent. And if we look at the fact that Prime Minister Abiy told um, General Burhan in, in Sudan two days before the war that to seal the border with Tigray, and if we look at the comments of the Amhara police chief about them being prepared for the war. Um, if we look at Abby's comments about preparing a, a secret drone capacity without the knowledge of Tigrayan leaders, um, I think it's pretty obvious what was being planned. Mengist Eritrea, the Mengist Ethiopia, the Hawar Koina, the Ethiopia Nuga Ilu, Kusugo Zikil Ilka, Hassab Balu. ዝሓት <laughs> Ethiopian government says that uh, Northern Command uh, was stormed by TPLF fighters because TPLF wanted to uh, take control of Addis Ababa. Aratian government says the same that uh, TPLF was planning to invade Arat. Uh, Tigray's government says that uh, Abi and Asayas, uh, president of uh, Arat, yeah, Prime Minister of Ethiopia, they planned this war. This is their almost uh, their official position. Now, Ethiopian governments claim that uh, it launched an offensive uh, on Tigray in response to attack on Northern Command. It's not very convincing, convincing because uh, even before the 4th of November, it was being said that Ethiopian government could launch an attack on Tigray. So it means that planning was there before the 4th of November. Ethiopian government, PM Abi, Aratian president, they planned this war before uh, uh, TPLF stormed Northern Kampu. That's what brings us to November 4th, 2020. My name is Maliti Brahana Mescal, and I live in Denver, Colorado. My name is Bakimos. Uh, I'm a small business owner. My name is Hausen Gebermethin. So my name is Kasich. It's obviously an alias that I go under. My name is uh, Mabel Mubarak. Uh, most people know me by Jamal. 
My name is Mahdi. Uh, Mahder uh, is my given name. Uh, Mahdi is what I, I go by. My name is Salam White Mangesha. My name is Tatlai. I'm based in, in Sweden. My name is Bethany Canfield and I live in Oregon. Um, my name is Jerusalem. Um, my connection to Tigray is all of my family, my extended family is from there. I was born in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. My family is specifically from Tigray. So I was born and I was raised in, in Tigray. Um, so Tigray is uh, my home. Uh, my family is located in Kweha and I grew up uh, in Ma'ala city before I moved to the United States about 16 years ago. My entire family is from Tigray. My name is Hausen, which is um, the city where my dad is from in Tigray. My parents fled um, Tigray in the 80s uh, and went to a refugee camp in Sudan. Um, at the time, there was a famine. My sister and I were born in the refugee camp in Sudan. My children are both Tagaro, so I've had a really strong connection to Tigray because of them. I want them to know where they come from, you know, who it is that made them who they are. I had actually been just commenting on the Tigray situation, the Ethiopian situation, the politics, probably for about a year, just under the alias before anybody even knew who I was. Um, mainly just to protect my family and and my partner because he's to grow away so you know sometimes I understood there was some some kind of backlash. Uh, my family's from Makala. I was born in Addis. My family and I we came to the United States in the um, early 90s. I grew up in Tigray and my mom, uh, my sister and uh, many uh, family members are still in Tigray. And actually, I was pushed out of Tigray because of war then. Uh, and I saw my uh, hometown bombed, air bombed uh, at that time. My connection to Ethiopia is that we um, lived, our family lived in Soto, Waleta for two years. Um, my husband is a hospital administrator, well, at that time was a hospital administrator here. And so he, we went over for two years and trained, um, helped train an Ethiopian administrator um, to help lead the hospital there. Actually, on social media, I follow a woman, um, a Tegaru woman who lives in Canada, and she started speaking about what's happening, what was happening in Tigray. And that's kind of when I started realizing, like connecting the dots and realizing like, oh, this is actually what's happening. So most of my family is uh, still in Tigray. I myself was born in Sudan because there was war on the people of Tigray at that time too. Um, so my father, my mother, and my brother and I all immigrated to the United States in the early 80s when there were very few Ethiopians here. In just a few weeks, a power struggle in Ethiopia between Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed and the rebellious Tigray region in the country's north has escalated into armed conflict. Abiy Ahmed says the offensive will end soon when the rebels are brought to justice. Well, it's almost impossible to verify any information from Tigray. Virtually all communications are blocked. He posted this message on Facebook threatening final enforcement action in the coming days. In the past few hours, he said his troops are marching on the regional capital, Mekele, which is held by the TPLF, and he's claiming significant victories. 25,000 people have now fled to Sudan since fighting broke out. Half of them are children. Ethiopia will not accept external mediation and will also not allow aid agencies into the country or uh, journalists into the country. Same question. Why? Well, I uh, um, uh, just have uh, told you that uh, this is an issue related to the sovereignty or internal affairs. So, and also it doesn't take uh, uh, many, many times. It's, it's really be going to be completed within a week. Therefore, we don't consider it, uh, it is a big deal. The United Nations uh, begs to differ with you. The United Nations thinks this is a big deal. The, the, the United Nations has described this as being on the verge of a humanitarian catastrophe. Ethiopian military force are professionals and they target on the, on the groups, the junta group, not the civilians who are 
some other social infrastructures. I mean, most of the emotion we were experiencing the first couple of weeks, I would say, was mainly confusion. Uh, we weren't we weren't sure if this was a war that's one, that was going to go on for a uh, few years or months. We don't know if it was going to come to an end, maybe like right away. I think two of my cousins made it to Addis within that first um, that first stretch of the war, um, the first two months. Uh, but in terms of the, the rest of our family who's in Rama, um, we didn't know anything. Um, and we didn't get news from anyone in our family until February. Um, and that was through like, you know, a quick, maybe one or two minute phone call that my, that my aunt got in Florida. Um, and that's when they informed her that my mom's mother had passed away, my grandma. I believe this was around December um, that we heard that uh, my, my uncle um, and some of his family members were, um, were victims of uh, Eritrean soldiers. And uh, this was really hard for our family to hear and to just even think about. And we can only just imagine what our families back home um, were feeling and experiencing. Uh, sorry, it just kind of gets really emotional when you really think about this and just like um, imagine you know, we're hurting here a lot, but our family back home, they're experiencing something completely different. Yeah. I am very close to my family, especially my elders in Tigray. I call all the time. I'm their <clears throat> financial support. So I send money all the time for my grandmother, for my elderly aunts and others in the area. And I kept trying to call and I couldn't get through. I literally would call every single day, multiple times a day. It was like an obsession almost trying to get through and I couldn't reach anyone. And I, I'll never forget though, when I finally did get through and it was on the 80th day of the war, I believe, and I was able to reach my great aunt and she called me and I saw a missed call on my phone and I thought, am I dreaming? <laughs> and I called her back and they had service for just a moment and she said that they had fled for the hills and they were literally hiding in the mountains and in the caves. I mean, imagine that, an 80 year old woman hiding in the caves. And I was trying to ask her questions and she was talking in code and it occurred to me that their phones are tapped. They can't even speak freely about what's happening to them. And so when I would ask her about Eritrean soldiers, she would just say things like, they're surrounding us, they're surrounding us. And, you know, but she wouldn't be very clear about what that meant exactly. But her house had been raided just like everyone else. The only other thing that she was able to tell me was, all the farmers are dead. I'll never forget that. She kept saying, all the farmers are dead. All the farmers are dead. And I'm thinking, all of our family are farmers. What is she saying? What is she, how do I interpret this and translate this? I made my way out of Tigray um, on, at the end of December. Uh, they, when they started doing the commercial flights again, I left behind my entire community, my employees. Mm -hmm. I left my whole life behind. As soon as the war was declared, there was an immediate um, uh, communication blackout, if I remember correctly. Uh, so I had, I think we had to wait until um, for about a month, if I'm not wrong, until the communication was reopened. So I was able, able to speak with my sister and um, her family who live in, in Matala. But my other family, my father, my mother and my siblings, they live in near Adwa. And I haven't, um, this should shock some of you re viewers, but I haven't been able to speak to them uh, for the last one, almost one year now. They have been totally um, in, in the dark, cut off. The first two months was brutal. All we heard is how bad the atrocities were. Every leaking uh, news we had was about children and young men uh, being killed. So I had no idea how my dad or my mom or the rest of the family was. Uh, so I mean, it was very uh, emotional waking up every day thinking that, you know, you can't get used to this new life, you know. It was like, I would wake up thinking that there was no war in Tigray. Things were the same, you know? But that wasn't the case. Every morning we wake up, just worse and worse news. The Prime Minister has told Parliament that the military did not kill a single civilian in this conflict. Really hard to believe. 
How can he be so sure of that? Because he has a report on the ground. He's the prime minister of the country. Uh, the military strategy, the, our defense forces drafted, avoided any civilian casualty. We've seen targeting of civilians and civilian infrastructure with heavy artillery fire. We have seen widespread looting of private property. We've seen extrajudicial executions of individuals. The United States has claimed that Eritrean soldiers have crossed into Ethiopia to help Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed's government battle the rebellious Tigray forces. So this is an insult to our military establishment. To say that we are depending on the help of Eritrean army, I can assure you in 100% terms, in 1,001% terms, there are no Eritrean armies operating in Tigray right I want, now. I'm wondering, though, how you can assure in 100% terms when the, the Americans say that they have satellite images, they say intercepted communications, anecdotal reports from the region. When Ethiopian government troops took control of the Tigrayan regional capital of Mekele last month, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed said the law enforcement operation against the Tigrayan People's Liberation Front, or TPLF, was over. Your government is insisting that this war is over, but we've heard otherwise from Tigrayan leaders. They don't have the capacity to be engaged in guerrilla uh, warfare. They have lost the support of the entire Tigrayan people. The, 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 the federal army is sweeping across Tigray quite quickly during, during November. Um, and then this sort of fairly devastating use of, of air power. Um, and, and so this turning into a sort of rear guard resistance and ultimately a sort of insurgency. Um, I, didn't, I didn't expect that within weeks. So it, it was just, a, just trying, to, um, trying to adjust really with very quickly developing events, some of which were surprising. But, but truly, I, 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 I never thought that that meant the end of the, um, of the, of the resistance. When the Amhara force entered Western Tigray, uh, it was with dual purpose in mind. One is to prevent, to seal off, to seal Tigray. Tigray should be uh, encircled 360. The only way they could get access, you know, be it for uh, refugees, you know, uh, uh, to go, uh, to, to run from Ethiopia, uh, or for food aid to come into Tigray, or for military uh, armaments to come to the Tigray, it would be through Sudan. So they have to block that. That's the first thing that they did was blocking that road. The second aim was uh, to ethnically cleanse uh, Western Tigray, because that's the land that they wanted to be uh, populated by Amharas. So they did a very thorough job, a very thorough job of cleaning that area uh, uh, of the Tigrinya speaking people. Uh, they have, uh, it's believed to have, uh, for them to have evicted almost a million people. The Eritreans did also their own part from the northern part of uh, Tigray. What they did was, especially they focused on men, on young men, and at the same time, they destroyed all the food products in the area, uh, both crops and uh, livestock. The same a blueprint was followed by the federal troops. The net result of all of this was more than two million people were displaced. Huh? Uh, and all of this were dependent from now on on food aid. Huh? Uh, the rest of the people were food insecure. And another thing that the Eritreans did was they aimed in particular on the health centers, be it uh, hospitals, clinics, pharmacies, and also one big factory in Adigrad that used to produce pharmaceutical products. The aim again is not only to kill the people in mass starvation, but also to kill them uh, through deprivation of medicine. So you could see the aim was a thorough way of uh, killing Tigray. Now, Eritrean troops fighting in Ethiopia's Tigray state systematically killed hundreds of unarmed civilians in the northern city of Aksum on the 28th and the 29th of November 2020. 
An Amnesty International report reveals that troops opened fire in the streets and conducted house-to-house -house raids in a massacre that may amount to a crime against humanity. According to dozens of testimonies, Amnesty says Eritrean troops came into the town and executed hundreds of civilian men and teenage boys. These are the names and pictures of some of the dead, voiced by a man desperate to memorialize those lost on a holy day in November. Families across Tigray have been sharing pictures of loved ones with CNN, whom they say have been killed in the violence across the region. The shoes you see mark the shallow grave of 15-year-old Johannes Yusuf. Abraham took the shoes off each body he buried and placed them on top of the grave so families could identify which grave was their child's. People in the region are traumatized while there is rampant hunger and an acute shortage of medicines. There are also reports of attacks on priests and nuns as well as churches being looted and vandalized. When the religious and historical sites were being attacked, it was clear that this was an attack on the identity of Tigrayans. Harsh Shiraj Mohammed has spent five decades managing the famed al Neji Mosque in northern Ethiopia's Tigray region. But when war broke out last year, the mosque in Nagash became a target as Ethiopian and Eritrean soldiers marched on the town on the way to the capital, Mekele. It's not only our heritage, but rather the world's heritage. It is the second Mecca. It is very sad not only for us, but the whole Muslim community around the world. So, Abiy Ahmed denied that Eritreans were there for a very long time. But we heard early on, early on, that there were Eritreans in Tigray. I think what was shocking is the extent of their evil. I mean, I don't think people imagine that children as young as four, year, four years old would be raped or that elderly women would be raped. I don't think anyone imagined that Eritreans would come in and completely loot Tigrayans. I mean, loot everything, all the way down to like plastic containers and storage containers for food. I mean, they took everything. The only thing that surprised me was the, the degree to which Ethiopians began to accept Eritrean involvement. Uh, I served in Ethiopia during the Ethiopian-Eritrean War when the hatred was just incredible between uh, Ethiopians and Eritreans, irrespective of your, of your ethnic background in Ethiopia. And that's all been turned on its head now. And you have um, some groups in, in Ethiopia sort of cheering for the Eritreans and their activities in Ethiopia. And I find that very strange and very worrisome. When I returned to the United States from Tigray, I had a really difficult time uh, assimilating to what was once my normal life. Um, I had severe PTSD. Every sound bothered me. Airplanes and helicopters were just, I could hear them from so, I can spot them from anywhere. Um, Emotionally, I just, I had a really difficult time and I am still having a difficult time processing things and going back to normal. I, I, I got involved with uh, the local, I don't want to say the local church, but just the local uh, Tagato community. So I contacted all the Tigrans around me uh, and uh, called them and said, what do we do next? And when I called them, they too were also having the same issues as I was. They weren't able to reach their immediate family members like their fathers, their mothers, their sisters. So the war broke out in November. Um, and I remember during that time, again, there was no communication. And I felt like I was sitting on my hands, not doing anything, but didn't really know how to help. Didn't know what to do to, to help my people. And I remember here in Denver, there is um, an annual event. It's, it's a Martin Luther King Day award ceremony that happens in January. And I remember sitting watching it virtually because of COVID, but watching it. And the person who won the highest award of the night um, was for her work with the Rwanda genocide. And her name was Roz Duman. And she is, her family are Holocaust survivors. She has this very deep passion for stuff.
stopping genocides from happening. And I remember watching it, being so shocked and saying, I need to call this woman. I need to tell her exactly what's happening in Tigray. And we, I, I do have power here. I have power to tell the world in my own way. So I got a, a group of about six of us, and I called this at the time Tigray Action Committee, just out of nowhere, because I wanted there to be some action rather than sitting on my hands and doing nothing. I called it the Tigray Action Committee. And we met with this woman and her, her whole nonprofit. There was about six of them on their side as well. And we met, we, we told stories about survival, we told stories about being refugees and coming and resettling here, and the fact that these same refugee camps are now opening back up after 30 years. And so from there, that's really what kicked off our activism. They helped us get in touch with so many representatives in government throughout the United States and really sparked our activism work. It started with the protests, you know. The first protest we had was actually the LA community organizers that called us uh, and uh, some of my friends. To me, it was a very uh, scary moment. Didn't know what to say. I remember even fighting with some of the, our group, like uh, Baki and everybody else saying, you chant, you chant, I don't want to chant, you know, like, because we were scared, like, I, I don't know what to say, like, what are we supposed to say? And then we were giving guidelines on, you know, the, what's happening. So we were saying, like, stop the drones, this. So we just stumbled into it because, it's, uh, like I said, it's not something we planned, but we had uh, the truth on our side, and we also had our families life on the line. We had our people's life on the line. So as soon as the war started, um, we, we launched the Tigahat um, website where we, we do advocacy, where we, we do documentation of everything that, that we receive uh, from Tigray about, about, about casualties, about destroyed infrastructure, about displaced uh, people and uh, about uh, other issues that we, we receive from, from Tigray. And I think that has been very helpful. My partner was in Tigray at the time, so um, that was just I couldn't I couldn't breathe most days. I didn't eat. I, I put I lost I think seven kilos within the first three weeks, just from utter shock. Like that was my shock. My initial shock reaction was just I was in a daze. I took the first two weeks off work. If I truly love the people, like I say I do, I, I can't be silent. I can't just sit there and, you know, expect everybody else to, to talk for these people. If, if I know it, I should be able to contribute in some way. I started my activism before I returned to the U.S. the second I got internet access in Ethiopia. And I was finally reconnected to the world after months of being under a communication blackout in Tigray. Um, immediately logging on to social media and seeing how the Tigrayan diaspora had mobilized, I, I went right in. I didn't, I didn't even wait to leave. There's this feeling that you need to be strong and you need to be strong for, for your people back home. You know, you, it's, we're doing everything we can literally everything we can we're advocating we're making phone calls i've sat in meetings with representatives calling representatives you know just to hear us out um for people to know that we exist you know that was just even like the first step it's like hey there are tagarus and people were asking what is that you know this is who we are this is our identity this is where we come from you know we are an ethnic group that makes up that is part of ethiopia and we are a target, and we are collectively being punished. And I was like, you know, I am just a regular person. I'm not like a political person. I, I'm not a diplomat. I can't do anything. But if this is what they're asking people to do, you know, I can do that. So um, that's when I started. Like, I literally just started like on on a couple of the campaigns. I literally just like tweeted every single, you know, just through every single tweet that they had. I saw the strategy the government and uh, its uh, allies and its supporters the elite uh, how they were you know having a system of blockade by the government so that nothing comes out of the ground but then when something goes out you know they deny it with full force uh, you know vilifying sources 
uh, all that activists and when they c- couldn't deny they uh, minimize they you know just uh, trivialize it you know saying it, it's nothing and when they couldn't do that they follow with another strategy of you know just uh, taking it making it acceptable you know as part of the game Right now we're going to a protest in LA. The protest today actually is for the Ethiopian government um, to open up humanitarian access to all of Tigray because the region um, is in need of basic supplies, uh, food. Uh, there is no communication. Uh, a report came out today that stated about 2.5 million people are in need of immediate food aid. The UN has complained that uh, they cannot access all of Tigray right now to deliver aid. It's a genocide happening. Our people are dying. Thousands of people are dying. They're burning our churches. They're burning our mosques. They're raping our women. While we're over here in a free country being able to do whatever we want, they can't do that. They have no food. They have no water. They have no medicine. So what we want is an end to this war. The U.S. needs to be involved. Everybody today that heard about this need to raise their voice, need to stand with humanity because this is humanity. You got to stand with humanity because I know everybody going to hear about it after it happens and they're going to act like they were mad, sad. No, it doesn't work like that. Stop it right now. In the city of Adigrat, the general hospital may be the only thing that works. The doors are open and the wards are full and the staff do what they can in this war-ravaged corner of Tigray. But there is so much pain in this dilapidated building. Four months into the Tigray war, stories of rape, many involving multiple Ethiopian and Eritrean soldiers, have become all too common. <laughs> Doctors are overwhelmed by the number of rape victims seeking help. They say rape is being used as a deliberate weapon in this war. Twelve years her son killed in front of her. She crying, she crying. When she remember him, the, her child, she crying. She is not stable. This is very painful service to us. How can I clarify it? Our families have been telling us about everything that's happened in Tigray, you know, as, as we could connect with them and get information. Everything they've told us has proven to be true. But we started hearing about how the words that were being said as women were being raped. He pushed me and said, you Tigrayans have no history. You have no culture. I can do what I want to you and no one cares. The women that have been raped say that the things that they say to them when they were raping them is that to they need to change their identity to either amharanize them or 
at least leave their Tigrinya uh, status. And so when you start hearing that, you recognize that this is actually rape is being used as a weapon of war. This is a direct order, not undisciplined soldiers who are doing this. The Amnesty International report about the sexual violence was brutal, it was terrible. But what was also very shocking was the backlash against Amnesty International for putting out that report and just the immediate dismissal and the denial. And that's sort of what sort of triggered me to, to really focus in on this. I think the way that the genocide justifiers or whatever, sympathizers, I think that's what, um, the way they go about um, talking to me Literally, um, there's no way that I can even engage back with it having it be like an actual conversation. Um, they just, there's name calling, there's um, just saying, you know, these people deserve it, you know, like all of that stuff. Um, there's just absolutely um, calling people monsters and snakes and um, yeah. So while the it is absolutely happening, the way that it's being done is so angry and hateful that it makes it really, it almost, I think it proves the point. This is a hateful thing that's coming against Tigray and it's, um, the dehumanization is, is very real. Disturbing videos which appear to show the killing of unarmed civilians in northern Ethiopia by people apparently dressed in Ethiopian army uniform have been obtained by the BBC. Armed men in uniform, leading a group towards a cliff edge. Bodies appear strewn across the ground. A man is urged to throw one off the cliff. These graphic videos and others like it were passed to the BBC and began circulating on social media last month. We've been able to match elements of the landscape shown to features visible on satellite images to identify the location, Mabere Dago in Ethiopia's northern Tigray region. Given to CNN by a pro-Tigray organization based in the US, it reveals the nickname of the whistleblower, but more importantly, the rank and division of the unit committing these crimes. <laughs> That's the voice of the Ethiopian soldier turned whistleblower. He names himself in the video twice and names his unit and division. Enough evidence for the Ethiopian government to pursue an investigation, but none has been confirmed. The whistleblower gives his phone to another soldier so he can also be filmed carrying out an execution. With this level of detail now revealed, we asked the Ethiopian government whether they have investigated and punished the perpetrators. We received no response. I saw myself weakening by the day, you know, whenever this uh, went up and, you know, continued, it was very difficult emotionally. So I was very, very, you know, selective in what I should watch, all that. So uh, I remember watching the uh, uh, Mahabara Dego, where, you know, these people were... I'm sorry. Yeah, so I watched the Mahabara Dogo video where uh, to this day I remember, you know, the man. You know, he was uh, forced to sit in the cliff and I still remember how he, uh, you know, put the uh, Natala on his shoulder. So. But because of, you know, how these things affect me and, uh, you know, we want to continue, right? Even to advocate, we have to leave, we have our jobs, you know, we have our families, our kids, all that. So I don't watch a lot of them. 
I was in Ethiopia around three weeks in total, a little longer than that, I think. I spent around a week of that in Addis Ababa, um, and then I was able to spend around a fortnight, I think a little longer, in Tigray. Yeah, so my article focuses on a group of young men, very young men, um, from one village in the far, far northeast of Tigray, stones throw away from the border with Eritrea in a place called Idob, which has its own historic culture, language that's kind of been cultivated in the hills and the valleys in that region sort of on its own somehow over the years. Um, and these kids were improbably, they, they were improbably brilliant at volleyball. Uh, they also played basketball and they were pretty good at that, but it was volleyball that they were amazing at. And they beat everyone. They were completely unbeaten in years across Tigray and further afield. And they were just starting to get a bit of a rapport, a bit, they were starting to get known um, in Tigray and across the country. And then along comes the war in November. And in January, uh, on uh, the, the Christmas day, they were taken out of their homes in this place called Alitena, this village that I just mentioned. Uh, they were lined up beside a river and uh, executed, all but one of them who managed to survive. Uh, and when I was in the region, he was being kept under lock and key in various safe houses by nuns or friends of the family. Uh, that region is heavily Catholic, which is quite unique for the country as well. Um, and I felt like through them, through those boys and through that tragedy, because that same village had suffered during the war with Eritrea in, in 20 years previously. In fact, I think it was exactly 22 years to the day when one of the boys' fathers had been dragged away and killed. You could tell not only the story of the current war in Tigray, but the, the war that's happened before. And through the elders in that family, you could tell the story of the troubles with the, with the communist regime and with the times of Haile Selassie. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken describes violence in Ethiopia's Tigray region as called ethnic cleansing. Testifying before Congress Wednesday, Blinken pressed for a probe and the exit of Eritrean troops. We have, four, as you know, forces from Eritrea that are there, and we have forces from an adjoining region, Amara, that are there. They need to come out, mm -hmm. and uh, a, a force that will not uh, abuse the human rights of uh, the people of Tigray or commit acts of ethnic cleansing, which we've seen in western Tigray, uh, that has to stop. We also need uh, full accountability. Uh, we need to get an independent uh, investigation uh, into what, uh, what took place there. Genocides, uh, on one hand, are complex, and on the other hand, they are amazingly uh, uh, simple, and they're also amazingly similar. While several genocides have taken place uh, across all continents, the uh, remarkable thing is that they seem to follow a common pathway. So my awareness uh, of uh, the genocidal journey in Tigray was really a gradual consciousness from the data and information and eyewitness accounts from reliable sources that were coming out. And they formed a pattern and uh, meaning individual events by themselves may be just individual atrocities but when these atrocities took on a connectivity a pattern and i began to recognize that i have seen this pattern before i had seen it in darfur i had seen it in rwanda even though those were different contexts and the means of killing were different and the actors involved were different. The pattern is very familiar. I could count on easily a couple of hands the amount of times I heard people in Addis Ababa talk about the fact that, oh, but the Tigrayans are rich, they own all the property in Addis, they they built all of this stuff up in Mekele. They they generally like they genuinely bought this idea that Tigrayans were and that's why I compare it to, to, to the ways that Jews were treated in Europe in the 1930s, in that they were seen, I heard stories about 
Tigrayans being unruly or dirty, but I also heard stories about Tigrayans being incredibly rich and powerful. And it's kind of, then it gives you carte blanche to dehumanize them entirely because they can be, they can be either um, evil and scheming or they can be unworthy of your care. People are being raped, murdered and tortured based on their ethnicity and their language and their culture. And in many cases, not a lot more. And that fits every description of a genocide that I can think of. It certainly fits the UN description. Um, so yeah, 100%, it's a genocide. ጀግና <laughs> ሰይጣን <laughs> Asam Mablat, Bablat in Aliagre, Bezede, and the way Yanis I termenter Rarden, Menat of a button program Makeral. Usually Australia, Tasmania to Baldesidalish, Bedo Australia to be. The Tasmania Gosauch and the South Seeker at the Fotochal, and the Sony Lizard of Winnebro, and the Sub, Bumunet of Watch. Hin Mat Bamat Fatbuchano, Yanin net me Balon Bashita. Because if it's not good, Casos to Nagoroch, Senat of Ovichan, and Baakal and Dainor. Do you agree at this stage that there's, there's a recognition that war crimes have taken place and that Abi Ahmad and Afarki are clearly guilty of war crimes? Surely, unless this happens, it makes a mockery of international law. When there was a question that has some. Uh... Uh, human rights violations or, or war crimes uh, occurred. Maybe maybe a word about what is the aim of uh, Ethiopia. When I uh, met the Ethiopian leadership in February, they, they really used this kind of language that they, they are going to destroy the Tigrayans, they are going to wipe out the Tigrayans for 100 years and, and, and so forth, which, which for me <laughs> referred to to very serious uh, human rights uh, uh, atrocities and crimes as, as well if you wipe out your your uh, national minority what is it it's uh, it, it, you cannot destroy all the people you cannot destroy uh, all the population in in, in Tigray. i think i was really naive in that i didn't realize just how divided Ethiopia is. I really thought there was a thing called Ethiopia that we all subscribe to, that we all belong to. And so when there were protests against what was happening to Tigrayans, I thought it was a no-brainer. I mean, we were, we were holding protests in Colorado, in Denver and in Aurora, saying, you know, say no to rape. <laughs> like, you know, food is not a weapon and, you know, don't bomb your own citizens. These seem like easy things for people to sign on to and subscribe to. But what I noticed is that, especially within the Amhara community, no one, none of them would show up. There may be one or two people who show up, but for the most part, they were completely silent, almost like they were relishing in what was happening. But even worse is when members of the Amhara community and the Eritrean community came together to hold a rally in support of the Ethiopian government. And I thought, there's no way these people who I know are gonna be at this rally. And a number of us actually went to that rally. There was one in Denver at the Capitol. And I literally saw people and friends, parents, and you know, who were there in support of this. And so myself and 
five other Tigrayans um, attended the rally and we had our cameras and we were filming and we were asking them like, how could you support a genocide? How could you support the rape of our families? And these are people I'm telling you that we know very, very well, people that we've worked with in community. And I mean, there's one woman in particular that broke my heart. Her son passed away. He had kidney failure and he's Eritrean. He had kidney failure. And I literally spent months fighting social security and going back and forth to try and get him care and aid. And when we finally got him approved, he passed away the very next day. I'll never forget that. It was really devastating. She was at the rally in support of the Ethiopian government. And I was thinking, oh my God, I fought for your family. How could you be here and fight against mine? It was just really devastating to see that, the emotional damage that that created. I don't know how you ever heal from that as a community. My background is in the Orthodox Church and I saw with people very close to mine, you know, to me, to my life um, for the last 30 years. They either are in the government, you know, part of the decision making of all these atrocities, all that. But outside also in the media, even in church media, they, you know, on daily basis, uh, create this narrative that Ethiopia is uh, you know, targeted by this entity, that entity, including myself. And I was part of the leadership for Canadian Alliance for the GERD until I was kicked out because of my advocacy for Tigray. I had uh, heavy involvement with other uh, non-Tagaro Ethiopians. In fact, the, they were the ones that we actually hung out with. We were never really around a lot of Tagaros. And after the war broke out, uh, all of those uh, relationships were actually damaged. Uh, well, to start with, uh, when the war happened, not a single person called and asked how our families were doing. And beyond that, they continued to make excuses to why the war was happening in Tigray and refused to hear to anything we had to say. So uh, the, I didn't see any reason in uh, continuing any, uh, you know, that kind of friendship with anyone. To think about our time there feels like a different country. Like it's, it was like the before the genocide and after the genocide kind of, um, kind, you know, like there was one country and now there's a different country. And before when I, you know, I met anybody from Ethiopia, it was very easy to just talk about so the will I die, you know, and just like be excited and they were excited too. And then now, you know, um, it's different. It's different communicating with people because um, you wonder what opinion they have. Identity and Violence was a wonderful book. He talked about how people can be very normal uh, one day and then the next day they could be denying genocide or committing genocide even. In the case of Rwanda, I think he, he highlighted. And it's about identities. It's about when you tap into somebody's identity, when you, when you sell them fear. And for that to happen so quickly, people have to want to believe those sorts of things. We have to understand the human psychology and its self-defending mechanisms are complex to the point that we're quite capable of committing evil even as you are capable of doing great acts of kindness. We are, we are able to ride to the rescue of people, even at the same time as we are able to bury our head in the sand. And a mixture of all those things is what you see in uh, situations uh, around the world. And what we're seeing in Ethiopia and Tigray is uh, not this similar to this phenomenon. Thousands are dead. Tens of thousands have been displaced. The Ethiopian government is on the defensive, but it has also decided to slightly open the door to outside observers. The decision by the Ethiopian government to allow us and other foreign journalists cover the conflict in Tigray follows months of international pressure. Aid agencies were blocked from delivering humanitarian aid by the government 
for four months. When we visited the region recently, we were able to get through an Ethiopian military roadblock and cross the front line to speak to the TPLF fighters in the town of Hauzen. Everyone we spoke to here expressed support for the TPLF. In Hauzen, 28-year-old Sega stood in line to have her baby seen at a hospital that had been raided and looted by Eritreans fighting alongside the government. She said the only thing she wants to do now is fight back. This 19-year-old says she was raped by an Ethiopian soldier early on in the conflict. She's tried and failed to terminate the pregnancy herself and thinks the baby may have died, so she's waiting to be seen at a hospital. As soon as she can, she wants to join the rebellion. It's hard to sort of calculate the mood of an entire region when there are so many different awful acts being committed all the time. Um, I felt that there was a fair degree of despair that the international community had either watched this going on and had intervened or didn't know it was going on. Um, that was one of the main things that I got from people there, was just that they felt that they didn't matter or that no one cared about them. Um, and I also because more and more young people were joining the TDF at the time, there was a huge sense of um, injustice, anger, um, sort of righteous anger and a, and a kind of um, a real desire to win back the region. If you're getting massacred every day and you're getting bombed and you're getting drone striked with UAE and Chinese drones, like, and then no one else is stepping in to help you at all. Uh, I mean, who wouldn't take up arms at that point? Yeah, from the very beginning, I was not uh, honestly convinced by the military defeat or the military win of the government, you know, uh, to subdue the people. Not because we are different, but because of the gravity, the level of atrociousness that afflicted by the government and by its troops, the people stood, you know, to defend, you know, their rights. People always fight when they're hungry. I, I see it on Twitter, people saying, if they're starving, they wouldn't be able to fight. No, that's when people fight. They, they, they don't fight when they're full. Nobody stops fighting when their families are starving. I was so hopeful about the UN Security Council having meetings about what was happening in Tagai. So hopeful. Um, looking back at it now, I understand I was so naive because I thought something would come out of these meetings. So I remember the, the very first open UN security meeting, I was glued in listening to every word that a representative in these different countries was saying. And when it got to countries that were supporting the Ethiopian government, I was just baffled by the stuff that was coming out of their mouths that it could have been written by the Ethiopian government. Like we're talking about countries like Kenya, um, Russia, China, India. In recent months, the council has been briefed and discussed the situation in Tigray privately a half dozen times. We've heard from NGOs and UN agencies about vast displacements, countless human rights abuses, hundreds of thousands of people facing famine, the bombing of civilians, the killing and intimidation of humanitarian workers, the sy systematic rape of women and girls and unspeakable acts of sexual violence. People are dying from hunger. People will continue to die unless they get the help they need and get the help they need now. We called for today's meeting because it's clear that a humanitarian catastrophe is unfolding in Tigray. It is clear that the threat of famine looms and that hundreds of thousands of people could already be starving. It is clear that without further and immediate scaled up action, many more will die. 
Right now, Ethiopia's effort to keep peace and development on track is still being challenged in many ways. China is also closely following the developments in Tigray. However, the Tigrayan issue is, by and large, an internal affair of Ethiopia, and we believe in the wisdom and ability of the Ethiopian people to find a proper solution. The situation in Tigray must remain a domestic issue of Ethiopia, and we believe that interference by the Security Council in solving it is counterproductive. We, the A3 plus one, conclude by reaffirming our respect for and commitment to the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ethiopia. We stand in solidarity with the government and the people of Ethiopia at this defining moment in their pursuit of sustainable peace that is conducive to nation building and prosperity. The international response has been in, in considerable measure disappointing, uh, not too surprising in terms of inability to come together with a common point of view. In the United Nations itself, uh, and particularly on the UN Security Council, which is the, the key organization in all of this, uh, you of course have five permanent members, any one of whom can, um, can veto a, uh, a proposal or an action. International community is one term, but there are uh, so many players. Uh, we have seen that at the UN Security Council, that uh, international community became divided. So we could not see any tangible, any concrete steps at UN Security Council. And the idea that, that the rest of the world is sort of watching this happen, this slow-moving genocide, starvation is a slow way to kill people. To commit genocide is, you know, usually you have these images of concentration camps and footage and stuff that you find out after the fact. This is something that we knew about for a long time. We knew that food wasn't getting in. We knew that people couldn't survive without aid, particularly after what the army, the Eritrean and Ethiopian armies had done to Tigray. We knew that people wouldn't be able to survive this, but we were sort of letting it happen. And we're still sort of letting it happen. And that's been the frustrating part is that we've, I believe that we've intervened for less. The international community has intervened for less. And I wasn't always in favor of intervention, but at this point, when people are starving to death because food is being blocked, it seems like there, there is a responsibility then to protect civilians. And so it's really, it's the scale of how many people are being impacted by the famine, but also the fact that it's just, if we accept that this is happening in Tigray, then we cannot stop this from happening other places. It's changing the rules of humanitarian law. There is no hunger in Tigray, there is a problem in Tigray, and the government is capable of fixing that. Well, let's bring you some breaking news now out of Ethiopia's Tigray region. A ceasefire, and we're getting reports that forces from the Tigray People's Liberation Front are in control of the city after government forces withdrew several hours ago. Ethiopia's government has declared a short ceasefire in its Tigray region after eight months of deadly conflict. And the regional government of Tigray says its forces have broken the backbone of the Ethiopian army. That's after the Ethiopian military suddenly withdrew from Tigray's capital and the Ethiopian government has now declared a unilateral ceasefire until September. So for sure this marks a turning point in the conflict in Tigray. After having taken back on Monday the regional capital, Mekele, Tigrayan forces have continued to advance throughout the region on Tuesday. They are now in control of several cities, uh, especially in the north of the region, of the region cities such as uh, Shire or Adwa. Ethiopia's 
And Secretary General Antonio Guterres said he was hopeful that the ceasefire would hold and the violence would stop. 5.2 million people are in urgent need of food aid. It's important to note that it appears to be a ceasefire because the government forces lost. Uh, the Tigrayan forces appear to have defeated them in Tigray. And so at that point, the government announced a unilateral ceasefire and uh, uh, having looted much of uh, Tigray, then pulled out with what they had looted. How have the Tigrayans, being so vastly outnumbered and outgunned, how have they turned the table on the central government? Well, they, they are a very proud, well-armed, very much experienced <laughs> militarily, they were the people who defended Ethiopia all throughout the uh, centuries. The major battles for the existence of Ethiopia occurred in their territory. The unilateral ceasefire was, of course, was not a ceasefire, you know. And, and the world understood quickly that it was not a ceasefire. Uh, because if you do a unilateral ceasefire, it, would, it should be willing to turn all the services back, you know, electricity, water, banking system, uh, especially the food aid, you know. But these people were saying, we will do in lateral fight, but we will continue our encirclement. The encirclement, is the whole, the whole problem is the encirclement. It's not, it was not the war per se. If you could encircle Tigray without conducting war, huh, that would even be better. The U.S. is watching with great alarm as a conflict that began in Tigray is now beginning to spread. Rebellious Tigrayan forces say they have seized the strategic town of Desi in Ethiopia's Amhara region. Ethiopia launched its third airstrike in a week on the capital of Tigray on Wednesday. Abiy has informed the nation that he's going to the front line where he'll personally lead the army and he's asked Ethiopians to join him in what he calls the battle to save the nation. There's a lot of controversy around TDF expanding out of Tigray and going into Afar and going into the Amhara regions. There's a reason for that. There is still a chokehold on Tigray. There are still no services in Tigray. There is still no food going into Tigray. As soon as Abiy was uh, routed out from Tigray, he, he went on TV and said that he was going to I mean, he didn't say that word for word, but the, the undertakes of this speech was that he was going to reorganize. And in the meantime, he was going to totally uh, cut off Tigray from every service. And he was going to leave the Tigrayan people with the TPLF uh, without any access to the outside world. And he was going to um, invade Tigray when the situation was appropriate, which according to him was when the farming season was um, over right so now when that is the case and when you have the when you have defeated the army when you have the momentum and when you know that if you don't continue on the momentum you are giving the enemy um time to reorganize and to come back and destroy you again what do you do you have to continue fighting you have to chase the enemy wherever they they, they are whether that is in afa or in ahara <laughs> Melkak Sinjemur, but I'm so much Tedanactual and Nantam Tedanactual. Makali is a resavat mentor Sinhid, Yenebro Gitchet, Yesabet Makel, Yemengist Makel, Yemenak Ona, Yemanako resource Makel, no in a borough. Zare can Sinuata boast with Segusagu, it a traffer of us a watching, Yemizerfu, Yemikamus, Amanashimita Gusa watching. Kamech Amaru Betele Wichi, Kabiyadi, Wem Kashiraro, Wem Kabashasha, Mile Yonagari, Elizabeth Markel, Nathan Atwal, Aum Balut Chabajunit. If you stay in Tigray, that's exactly what they want you to do. Because they want to buy enough time for the mass starvation to take place. Because they have already done the job of preparing Tigray for mass starvation. For much of the conflict, the United States, the United Nations, and the international community have failed to hold high-level Ethiopian officials to account for their role in atrocities committed in Tigray, and now CNN's findings point to a renewed campaign of ethnic cleansing, one which bears all the hallmarks of genocide as defined by international law. This is the Sittit River, 
a source of life for the people living along its banks. For weeks, the river has been bringing with it dark secrets from the Ethiopian region of Tigray. Mangled corpses are mysteriously appearing here, downstream in Sudan. On both sides of the border, Tigrayans keep a grim tally of those believed to have been executed by Ethiopian forces that somehow end up in the river. From the binds still biting into his skin, it's clear this man suffered a tortured death. A new dawn rises. Witnesses and local authorities tell us it brings with it 11 new bodies. Based on descriptions from multiple escaped detainees, Humara and its surroundings have become a mass detention facility. Via eyewitness testimony and satellite imagery, we verified the existence of at least seven mass detention facilities in Humara. When the Ethiopian and Amara forces entered the town, people were panicked and began running to the farms. They started killing people. No warning, just shooting. They shot at people running. Soon, an interim administration for Western Tigray was established by forces from the neighboring Amhara region, an administration hostile to the presence of Tigrayans. People said Tigrayans need to leave the town immediately. They were thrown everywhere. They said, you Tigrayan, you should disappear from the land west of Takaza. You are evil and we are purifying your blood. Militia would even write on the houses that belong to Tigrayans. This is ours. This is Amhara house. They told us not to speak in Tigrinya. We're in Denver for the Tigray Fest and landed here last night. It's my first time going to Tigray Fest. I think this happens every year. On the flight, I was reading Time magazine, and I saw a quote from the president of Tigray, Debretion Gabriel says, the most important thing is that my people are free, free from the invaders. Leaders of the Tigray region in Ethiopia in a July 3rd interview with the New York Times. So last week, I think I was reading Newsweek or Time magazine, and they had a segment about the famine in Tigray. So I'm happy it's staying in the news, even though it's not getting the kind of coverage we're hoping for because of just how massive the need is. The Olympics are happening in Tokyo. I usually get excited about the Olympics, cheer on Ethiopia runners. But this year, I'm not watching it. I don't know. Just the feeling is not the same anymore. ሁሉ <laughs> አጽልማቴ <laughs> Just got here late last night at uh, 1.45, but you know, nothing will stop me speaking for my people and spending time with them as well.
I, I had a lot of questions, you know? Uh, I mean, I'm sure we all do as Altic brands, uh, Ethiopians, Eritreans, we all have questions because majority of our answers come from, uh, from the news outlets or it comes from uh, you know what someone else tells us or what the Ethiopian government tells you or the Tigre uh, or TPLF or T TDF or whoever tells us, you know? But you want to be able to see it yourself, you know? If we had an option, we would go to Tigray and find out ourselves. Uh, the only place that you have uh, a, a place to go and talk to Tigrayans is in Sudan. You know, you get to speak to Tigrayan refugees uh, who have been affected and impacted by this war and actually help them out one and then also interview them ask them questions and see what happened what caused this who's responsible and i had to go do that because it is either going to go ahead and tell me everything that i have been fighting for is wrong or it's going to reaffirm it and when i got to go, when i was when i was able to go to sudan everything that i've been fighting for for the past almost nine months now have been right we got to know some uh, refugees in the camp heard some some of their stories, which were sad, most of them are from uh, Humara. They, they, they left Tigray uh, like the, during the beginning of the war. So majority of them are from Humara and they've seen uh, horrible atrocities uh, being done. A lot of children who don't know where their parents are. What Ethiopia's Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed predicted a year ago would be a short-lived military offensive against rebels in Tigray not only continues but has escalated. One year after he sent in troops who committed unspeakable atrocities in an attempt to crush the rebellious Tigray region, the army he sought to defeat is now heading down the highway towards the capital of Addis Ababa. In the latest, Ethiopia has now outlined conditions for possible talks with rebels from the country's war-hit Tigray region. One of the conditions for possible talks will be for the TPLF to withdraw from the Amhara and Afar regions. Since we last met, uh, I was able to start an organization with a few friends of mine, and that organization is called Free Tigray. And Free Tigray is an organization that ends the oppression of Tigrayans and support their fight to become an independent state. Okay. Tigray is a part of Ethiopia. We've that's, that's how we know Tigray today. And as it stands, the Ethiopian government has not done what it is supposed to do, which is protect its citizens, including Tigrayans, who are part of Ethiopia. The problem is the government is pushing Tigrayans away. So they'll say things like, you know, they are juntas and they are terrorists and they are, you know, he's able to, they're able to cut our services off and disconnect us from the country, allow a whole foreign country to come in and invade Tigray as if we're not a part of Ethiopia. So even though Tigray is a part of Ethiopia, all of the government's actions say otherwise, say that we're this, this separate independent place, you know, that, um, that doesn't deserve to be taken care of by its you know, or at least be in relation with its with the central government. So there is this big question about whether Tigray should be independent. I truly believe that that is a question for Tigrayans to, to discuss. But at this moment in time, I don't even think that's the, the main um, goal of everyone who's advocating for Tigray. We're advocating because we don't want our families to die first and foremost. Tigray is nothing if the people have all perished. I'm a big supporter of uh, the people choosing their own uh, path. Uh, me, personally, my opinion, I don't see Tigray uh, going back to Ethiopia and peace continuing after everything that's happened. But uh, who am I to say? I mean, I'm just one person. So first, I'm more interested in freeing the whole Tigray. People are angry. Yes, people are angry. Uh, Tigrayans, they are angry. They say that they... Uh, have gone through a lot. They do not want to be part of uh, Ethiopia. Uh, TPLF is showing majority, I think. Here. TPLF is playing with its cards close to its chest. It's not calling for independence. Uh, it's not rejecting it as well. Uh, TPLF is showing maturity regarding the question of independence. Common Tigrayan is angry. He wants independence. Ethiopia just it, it, it is, it seems to me like a great empire, but it doesn't feel like a, a coherent country at all. 
depending on where you are in the country, you'll you'll hear wildly different opinions on what Ethiopia even is. And I don't think you get that same level of conversation in other countries. And in fact, one one of the few places you do is probably the UK <laughs> with different countries uh, wanting to separate and, and uh, go their own way. It, it's a very nice idea in principle that people have a right to secede and self-determination. But the reality is that um, there are so many groups around the world uh, that if every single one of them were to have their own country, uh, we would deal with a very, very anarchic uh, world system of what would essentially be predominantly microstates. You know, a lot of countries are nervous about the idea of secession, not just because they're worried about the impact it'll have on, you know, within their borders. So if they recognise another group as having a right of secession, uh, then will another country say, well, that's good, but what about this group in your country? We now recognise them. So, you know, they don't like to do that. There are very, very few examples of secession in modern international politics that effectively, uh, since 1970, only three countries have become independent through secession. Uh, and that was essentially Bangladesh, Eritrea and South Sudan. You then have, if you like, the three Eastern European state dissolution. The thing we really have to focus on is it's not the declaration of independence that matters. Anyone can declare independence. What really is absolutely crucial is wider international acceptance. Uh, and this is the mistake that very often uh, communities will make, that they'll rush into a declaration of independence, nobody will recognise it. Now, in, in some cases, if they've got an outside patron state, a country that will support them, usually a neighbouring state, they can survive without that recognition. This is the, the, the real question that I have in my mind about Tigray, that, you know, if it declares independence, uh, who's going to recognise it? And how is it going to be able to survive? Because Ethiopia will close off its airspace, uh, it's landlocked, Eritrea will do the same. There's a small border uh, to its west uh, with Sudan, but is that going to be sufficient enough, um, you know, for the country to be able to survive? So I think, you know, I can see why many people would be talking about independence, but from a very, very clear practical perspective of how would it actually have that wider international recognition and that ability to interact with the wider world, it's going to be very, very difficult indeed. This month, Ethiopia marked one year of civil war. Last week, Ethiopia's government declared a state of emergency and called on citizens to defend the capital city. Now, this conflict, which started in the northern region of Tigray, has spread to the neighboring states of Afar and Amhara. Rebel Tigrayan fighters are now moving south towards the capital and have so far claimed control over two cities north of Addis Ababa. Now, with this conflict is a worsening humanitarian crisis in northern Ethiopia. Let's talk some numbers now. World Health Organization says 5.2 million people are in dire need of humanitarian aid. 2.1 million people are displaced. 400,000 people are close to famine. I understand that pain is the norm in this world. And I understand that genocide is everywhere. We have protested for over 365 days. This is our families. Our families are dying. They're dying. There is no exaggeration. But we are asking you to please contact your local elected officials. That is all our ask is contact your local officials. Share what you see today. These faces, they're not strangers, they're my family. I don't know them, but they're my family because we have the same struggle, we have the same fight, we have the same trauma. We have done one year, one year of any genocide. There's no exaggeration in all those families. I have not spoken to my parents for four and a half months. So I'm asking you, and you are taking pictures of us today, the one thing you can do.
Monday morning, that's what I say to you, as you enjoy your coffee, there's just a contact, an email, a call, ask them, hey, have you heard about what's happening in Sakai, Ethiopia? Do you know what their government is doing to them? Do you know that this girl that they saw and her monument has been spoken to her family in four and a half months? I don't know if my family has food, I don't know if my family has water, and I'm asking that I know this is my face, but so before you go to sleep tonight, I want you to remember me, I want you to remember every single person here, and I want you to know that this is not just my story. There is almost six million people who have no access to food, no access to food, right here, right here. This is the Ethiopian government doing this to our own Today marks day 500 of the Tigray War. Here are some updates. After the Ethiopian federal government and Eritrean troops were driven out of parts of Tigray, the whole state has been under siege. Western Tigray and some parts of Northern Tigray still remain under occupation. All telecom, internet, and banking services have been cut off by the federal government to millions of people. Tigray Defense Forces have retreated back into Tigray after getting within 130 miles of Addis Ababa. Leadership of the TDF said they did this for strategic reasons, but they also acknowledged the role of highly effective Turkish drones used by the Ethiopian government. After the TDF went back into Tigray, the Ethiopian government conducted several airstrikes on Tigray, killing dozens of civilians. I have taken you on a long, long journey, but believe it or not, there's so much I have to leave out. Like the mass arrests of Tigrayans all over Ethiopia, the horrible investigation UN Human Rights Council held jointly with the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission, which is funded by the Ethiopian government, looking into human rights violations during the war. They concluded more investigation needs to be done without even going to areas in Tigray where the worst atrocities were committed. Another thing that has really broken my heart is the Tigrayan forces being accused of mass killings and rape while they were in the Mahara and Afar regions. They too need to be independently investigated and held accountable. I have been working on this documentary for over a year, and while I was editing it, Russia invaded Ukraine. And I have to say, I have attention envy. Ukraine is getting the attention it deserves, there's no doubt about that. But it had me thinking, why didn't our families and victims of conflicts around the world get the same level of attention? Forget lawmakers, I'm getting emails from companies every day talking about they stand with Ukraine and how they're doing fundraising for humanitarian needs. We've been advocating for over a year. The Tigray conflict has been called the worst humanitarian crisis in the world. And yet, we never made it to front page news. Even the UN saying 100,000 children in Tigray are at imminent risk of death from malnutrition never broke through to front page news. Somebody recently referred to the Tigray war on Twitter as the forgotten war. But for us, it's not forgotten. Aid workers and Tigray forces in Ethiopia today confirmed that as many as 65 people were killed in an airstrike in the country's northern Tigray region. It happened yesterday at a school that was sheltering people displaced by the two-year-long internal conflict. 